Like Marissa said, my name is Patrick McFadden. Um, I do developer relations stuff here at Datastax. I also work quite a bit in our open source side. I do open source strategy. Um, spend most of the time giving away software. That's what I do. Okay, so I'm telling you to stop using databases. This is the world we live in, right? When the, when the database becomes like this, this, it's tyrannical. It's just like, this is the center of the universe. And we have to like, go ask it, please, can I have data? I wrote this perfectly, perfect SQL statement. And it's like, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> and the issues that we, we've always run into is that developers especially have to really know a lot about databases to use them to be effective and more importantly to get the most out of it um if you don't if you're using something like mysql um it's very different from imp implementation from say oracle and um and if you're using a no sql database like cassandra also very different and it require it puts a lot of knowledge and this 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 thing where you have to go pray to the altar of the database to get the best performance and the best use of that database um i've been working on this for so long i i forget sometimes that you know i know how to optimize an sql query for oracle because i know how to optimize like table scans and row scans and um cassandra same thing i know how to build partition keys and clustering columns that are proper that will give you sub millisecond um performance and works well in a huge thousand node cluster that's a lot of to expect from somebody who's starting or let's say the first day that they're there and then so what we've done is we've created this whole the order of the sacred dbas that we all have to like ask very politely and i was one of those people um this is a group of people that whenever things are not going quite the way you expected them to uh that you call and say, hey, Oracle DBA, my query is slow. Um, and I, uh, I, when I'm in, this, in the middle of doing like work as an Oracle DBA, um, I'm in this mode where, hey, um, I'm gonna listen to your question, but I don't think, um, sorry, just a minute. The, uh, when I'm in the mode of being an Oracle DBA, um, I'm going to be listening to questions and I'm going to try to answer them. Well, in that mode, I, I'm in the, I'm just going to be like, well, I'm going to help you the best I can, but it, I'm going to be hoping that someone's going to know what they're doing because that's a lot of questions I'm going to get. And you know, this, if you're a DBA, it's like, Hey, how come I'm, you know, my, uh, my query is two milliseconds slower than the last one. Well, I don't know. Let me go check the index or things like that. I mean, it's just a lot of deep knowledge. I and mean, then here's when you start learning things like explain plan, right? Um, and then this is, I think this is where we where we land with using databases is we have these design time trade-offs. Um, design time trade-offs, application, and you know, we're gonna be building our application, and it's this meeting, you know, where you're on the whiteboard and you're saying, okay, look, we have this thing, what are we gonna build? And in that meeting, you have to make trade-off discussions. Say, um, what are my what are the needs of the application? Uh, what are the scaling requirements? How do I deploy it? And <clears throat> each one of those comes with a trade-off. And the trade-offs usually are your best guess. And sometimes they're not the best best guess because whenever you deploy it, you learn that oh wait, the scaling requirements are completely different or something else. So this is a really hard and probably most stressful part of building your application like in the design phase is just making the right choices. And luckily in 2021, we have better choices that give us less of those problems. Um, and then here's this. Um, it's funny because we're doing this with the Linux Foundation and CNCF. Of course, we love cloud, but y'all love some cloud. and that has changed so much of how we do things now and running databases now um i think from from a standpoint of cloud and database not a whole lot has changed there has been some changes but you're still probably doing like a bare metal ish type of deployment you're still under trying to understand a database but that is changing um that is hopefully going to change and we're going to get to that in a minute but um 
the fact that you're deploying in cloud and you're probably not racking up hardware anywhere, because I, I can't even remember the last time I did that, um, it gives us a whole lot of new opportunities, right? And then Kubernetes, come on now. That is, it's done. Don't ask questions. Of course it's taken over and for good reason. The thing that I have really started to love about where Kubernetes lands in the in the grand scheme of building applications is, you know, we've we've slowly abstracted layers over the years, where we went from bare metal to virtual machines to containers. Um, we went from you know from bare metal that we install ourselves to instance types, um, then eventually to you know running containers in the cloud, but now Kubernetes, and and all of those you had to kind of run yourself. Now Kubernetes is abstracting the next layer, which is abstracting entire data centers. You know, Kubernetes is a data center abstraction. It's virtualized data center. So I deploy an entire data center worth of app an application. And <clears throat> it is really amazing how that is the timing is perfect because it keeps us from getting too locked into one thing, like if we want to move from on-prem, but that means that we need to really understand the entire picture of deploying an application with something like Kubernetes because we're building the entire virtual data center and it needs to be able to hold up to our application needs. So this is where we get to the data services. So I'm saying stop using databases, but use data services. And this is a fundamental shift in your thinking, in your deployment, everything. Um, and I'm gonna go into why. I don't think this will be too much of a shock, but this is a, this is something that I feel like we need to, uh, as a, a community of application builders and database professionals, we need to start thinking about things in terms of data services, just like how we went from deploying containers on our own data centers to deploying in Kubernetes. So <clears throat> a data service is pretty simple, and um, there have been versions of this in the past. This isn't too crazy, but this is, we're getting into more a uh, defined space now. Um, data services are an abstraction layer. Um, the underlying, the, the top line is the APIs that developers need, probably some sort of HTTP API like REST, GraphQL, gRPC. Um, the uh, SQL, CQL, document, Gremlin, you know, those are protocols that do work um, and can work on your database. However, the data service um, really wants to abstract the layer. Like it wants to hide the implementation from the underneath. And um, this is what I think if you look at like the left side, this is probably what you want to use mostly anyway, because you're not thinking when you're using REST, you're not thinking, wow, am I using, you know, am I using the right keys here for an optimized query? Well, that keeps our developers from having to overthink about what's going on below the line. And the below the line is the actual database itself. Um, and yes, we're still using, someone's still using a database, but the data service is abstracting that layer away. And you think about it in terms of how we deploy it, that's where it gets interesting. So, so there's some great examples of these out there. Um, this is, uh, there's, um, So there's a lot of these, uh, you know, out there already. And hang on. So whenever we have, I'm sorry, there's a guy, something that happened outside. So Accio is a really interesting project by Facebook. It's a data service that um, has some really cool features like it, it abstracts as geographics and things like that. Um, at no point does it, the, engineers that use it have any idea what database they're using or where it is. And that's the point. They wanna bring in uh, engineers that are um, gonna be ready to use or to build the front end part of Facebook and Instagram on the first day. They don't want to have them to go through multiple days of uh, learning or multiple months of learning all the back end data systems. That's just not important. And Accio takes away a lot of the really interesting things that, um, that are great for keeping your application online, but developers shouldn't have to worry about like data placement and uh, replication, things like that. So in the, in the, when we're using a database, um, you have some things you can do here. Like for instance, um, you're something you have to do. 
like you have to make sure that the driver's installed, that you have to um, initialize that connection to the database. You have to create a prepared statement, then you execute the statement, and then you finally parse and use the result. This is a block diagram, but this is pretty much every database that you use. Um, there are some, you know, there's some details in there, of course, but I mean, that's mainly what we have to do every time we want to use a database. It doesn't matter if you're using Node.js or Java or whatever. Um, and I'm going to check, are my, are my slides advancing? Yes, they are. <laughs> okay, so you, know, you have to do that checksum. <laughs> so when you use a database, um, this, this is the way it should work, right? Well, what happens when you're using data services? Well, we cut out a lot of that stuff. From here, we're just executing a statement and parsing and using the results. And what this eliminates is a lot of stuff, a lot of the ceremony. We like to call it that, but it's the, am I using the correct driver for the correct database? Um, am I managing my connections properly? And if I'm not, how, what does that do to the database? Uh, you know, if you work a lot with like Oracle, keeping open database connections forever is really a bad idea. Um, and so uh, pooling, connection pooling, that sort of things. It puts a lot of burden inside of your application code and then eventually for application developers because all of that gets you can you can hide it in implementation but eventually you know there's going to have to be dealt with and when you're using data services over http apis you're you're just providing an endpoint and those data services provide um, enough get and put operations so that developers on the front end can just keep moving and that's what we really want that's the dream right and this, uh, this is a great slide to show, first of all, danger, iceberg, but it's also shows the implementation. Like this is what we want. We want this top line to look, oh, it's just this cute little iceberg out here. It's very easy to use, but that messy, big mess details underneath is hidden. Um, and so there's, a, there's some stuff happening at, at I'll, I can't name, there's a lot of these projects out there that I can't talk about. I will talk about one that I can, <laughs> but um, because, and the reason I can't talk about them is because they haven't quite gone open source yet. And, but think of all the hyperscalers, the big companies that are doing scale operations, they're all moving to data services and staying away from databases. And mainly because of the messy details. Why not have a small core group of people that manage database operations? Like what if I want to migrate from one database to another? Um, or I want to migrate from one data center to another, um, you know, things like that. Or I need to do some operations on my database that gen generally would require me to have a negotiation with developers. No, just abstract the whole thing. As long as the API is online, everything's good. It gives you the ability to change things underneath. All right, there we go. Oops. So <clears throat> here are the three things that I would consider criteria for data services. Oops, back, back. You need to have on-demand scaling. You need to be elastic, meaning you just pay for what you need. So if it goes up, it goes down. And you need near 100% uptime. Um, these things give you that maximum flexibility with a minimum amount of trade-offs. And when you think about when you're building applications um, and you're having, uh, you're having these discussions built on this application build time, these are three things that you would really love to say, these are not the problem. Yeah, are we gonna have enough? Yeah, we'll get whatever we want when we need it. Is it gonna be online no matter where we are in the world? Yeah, should be up, no problem. That's what it's built to do. And then finally, is it going to blow out our budget? Nope, it's not going to do that because if we don't use it, it's going to scale back down and we're not going to have to pay for it. Great. Okay, moving on to the other thing, spaces or tabs. I'll let you figure that out for yourself. Um, but we have less of a, of a conversation around just data. And man, I'll tell you, this could really make your life better. <laughs> now, open source is coming to the rescue on this one because uh, cloud databases um, have started to going down this route. And um, we know that, you know, there are cloud uh, serverless databases out there or data services that um, 
basically are there to lock you into their service. And it, it's pretty well known, you know, they, they want you in their walled garden. So if you're in cloud X and they have a very bespoke data service that works inside of their cloud, they know if you move your data into it, you're probably going to be there for life, right? Because you know how it goes. Oh, someday we'll move our database to this other database and we'll be fine. That's no lock in. Yeah, that's called technical debt and you're never going to get out of that. Um, so this is what's been really fun to watch with Kubernetes is because we're virtualizing data centers and we can do this kind of stuff like, you know, create the entire application, including the data layer, we can move this thing around. So if I, you know, if, if I want to run in GCP, Amazon and Azure at the same time, totally fine. If I want to just run run at a time, totally fine. But it, the data portion is the key to portability and open source to the rescue. Open source helped us a long time ago. Um, I remember when I was back in the nineties, remember that? Um, I was working with, we, we had operating systems we had to pay for a lot. I mean, it was Solaris was not cheap, um, but you know, here comes Linux and it changed our scale equation. Like instead of installing one big server, we started installing tons of little ones and they were great. And because we were using Linux, open source changed the economics of it. Um, same with all sorts of infrastructure. Um, databases, MySQL, Cassandra, um, analytics like Spark, they've changed the, the, the whole game when it comes to the economics of scale. And same thing's gonna happen with data services. Now I work, um, like I said, with Kubernetes uh, quite a bit now. And this portability is really important, especially when it comes to building applications. Developers should be able to use their laptop. Uh, you could run it, you know, if you still have on-prem software or hardware, great. If you want to run it in the cloud, great. All of those things should work just fine and not have to be really super different. Like you should not have to say, well, I'm going to deploy it on my laptop. It's going to be completely different from what I'm going to deploy in production. Using Kubernetes now, we have the ability to build not only what we need, but put it into a CI CD pipeline so that the configuration is stored in Git, our virtual data centers run in any place that we can run Kubernetes. So <clears throat> this, this e equation has changed quite a bit. Um, so I work on a couple of open source projects and I'm going to kind of get into some like more specific examples. And this is why I'm really, one of the reasons I'm really passionate about it is because as someone who's been working with um, with open source databases and uh, like Cassandra, um, MySQL for years, um, I'm seeing like this is like the next wave is where we now take the data layer data services into Kubernetes and we just use all that good stuff that we've built over the years. Um, I don't think we need a new database. Um, not at all. Um, there's lots of great databases out there that do lots of great things. But what I do think is we need a new relationship with our databases <clears throat> in a cloud native architecture. So um, I'm going to go over some of these um, real quickly and just give you a highlight of what they do and why we're, you know, what these open source projects are about and why I think this is the right direction. So <clears throat> Stargate is a not only a cool name for a project, but it also does things like uh, create HTTP APIs like REST, GraphQL, document APIs, and it even does native format, just like I was showing you before in another, uh, in another slide. But <clears throat> it, it is built for deploying on Kubernetes. Now, this gives you this a lot of options for developers. It gives you lots of options because you can just choose to write API or client or framework. And it, it abstracts away a lot of stuff. And it's, it's not easy because sometimes you have to think about um, what's under, you know, there is some thought when you deploy it about how you deploy it with your software or with your underlying database. But, you know, this is left up to the SREs. And if we can provide that as, or as SREs, our developers just are fine. They're going to be just fine because they're going to want to use something like Node.js and a REST API or a GraphQL and not think about, oh, do I need to download a driver? Um, that's, don't need to do that. So 
it, it, re it really gives us the ability to separate out our traffic from our, our data traffic from the actual database itself. And they can scale independently. Um, and then as new APIs start popping up, we can add those and start building out this whole infrastructure. <laughs> the architecture right now for what uh, Stargate does is it has a, the first layer is, is basically just, uh, it accepts HTTP calls uh, from a variety of places and then negotiates with the underlying databases. Right now it uses Cassandra because that was the first implementation. Um, there are other databases that are in, in the pipeline, as they say. Um, there's other open source database projects that will, that will participate in Stargate and make those happen. Um, and that's the point of this is making it just so that we could have uh, a, a meeting place for databases to present themselves as a data service. And if you think about it in terms of like, this is very modular, just like how Kubernetes is very modular, um, we can build out all the different parts. And those parts are how we deploy things into our infrastructure. Um, just like as we build storage network and um, storage network and compute in Kubernetes, that's how we consume things. We can do the same things with our data layer. Um, the other project that I've been pretty heavily involved with is a project called Kate Sandra. And um, this is a little more into the database side for sure. Um, but what we're trying to do is take Cassandra and completely eliminate it as a, an operations problem and make it easier for people to deploy it into Kubernetes. But ultimately with the goal of making it so that it's just a data layer for Kubernetes. Um, you're not really thinking about what the database is. Um, yeah, I know the, the word Kate Sandra is a little bit of a mashup and it's cute, but um, you should be able to deploy it and have the three things that I talked about. You should be able to have an always on uh, elastic scaling, high scaling data service without a lot of work. Um, it's, it should be an SRE topic that's pretty simple and your developers should get what they need out of it. So the Things that are built on, um, we use an operator internally for Cassandra. Um, we, we use Stargate, so it implements Stargate to provide a data gateway. So when you deploy it, it has, um, it has all the services that you, your developers need. And then it uses, uh, it works with traffic in this case, but it works with others as well for Kubernetes ingress. Um, and then it has operations tools that run automatically in the background for all the operations tasks that normally you would have to do manually, um, it does those automatically. And this is, when we put all this together with metrics and, and observability, you get a pretty usable package that you deploy pretty easily. Um, you just deploy it, developers can use it any way they need to, you can deploy it anywhere. Um, and this is where open source really look at every one of these things is open source. So if you want to deploy it at Amazon, you want to deploy it in Google, you want to deploy it on your laptop, totally cool. And it's portable and it's, you know, we have in open source, there's free as in freedom and free as in beer. This is free as in freedom. You don't have to be tied up into a certain walled garden. Um, you can you can move it around however you need to. And because these projects are all open source, you can also do a lot of manipulation and changes. Um, it's one of the things with Kate Sandra that's really exciting is it's a lot less about code contributions from the community. And if you look at the PRs, it's a lot, it's, it's a lot less about code and a whole lot more about configuration, um, deploying, you know, like how you deploy things. So it's, it's turning into a, like a collection area of SRE knowledge around deploying scale applications in Kubernetes. And then we use Helm eventually for a lot of this stuff to get deployed. Um, Helm makes it easy. It's right now this, it's the, the first class in the project, but um, we will, I think we'll see soon that it, it'll be departing. It'll split away from Helm. So the, the idea here is whenever you're building applications um, and if, if you think about like all the things that interact with your data layer, um, it's creating some abstractions inside of Kubernetes 
that allow for that to happen. So if your web and mobile apps, microservices, et cetera, need a data service, um, this will provide that in Kubernetes. And it'll run on any infrastructure because it's just running in Kubernetes. Um, the, the keys are really just making sure that, you know, you have uh, a stable or Kubernetes cluster. And um, some of the knowledge that we are building now is around things like making good storage uh, choices, how to work with ingress, that sort of thing. So back to my slide. <laughs> so Stargate is kind of the tip of the iceberg in this case, where it's just like, here's the, here's this nice light little piece of ice floating on the water, nothing to see here. All that messy detail is handled automatically underneath through Cassandra. And this is an interesting, uh, this is what's interesting about this is that we're building up projects within projects. We're starting to wrap projects and projects, but um, Kubernetes is the destination for, I think all of our application infrastructure eventually, at least in the, in the next 10 years. And we're, we're really trying to make this a, a place where everyone can gather and bring knowledge and share and create a community around building data services. And no matter what underlying database you have, no matter what deployment infrastructure you're using. So that is all I have. <laughs>